Jennifer, congrats. I can't believe it's been 10 years since uh, this film came out. And I, I was just curious since, uh, you know, some creatives don't like to look back. They leave stuff in the behind. How has this experience been, you know, celebrating the 10th anniversary, looking back and, and revisiting this, this great film of yours? Oh, thank you, Tyler. Well, initially I thought, oh, I don't want to, you know, get involved in in that. And then IFC approached me and said, you know, we want to do a re-release. And they they put so much thought and care into it. And I and now I'm now really excited. I'm coming to America next week um, to be a part of it, be part of some Q and A's. Yeah, I'm I'm thrilled. I mean, for a filmmaker to we just hope that our films get seen. And to be for a film to be remembered 10 years later, it's pretty wonderful. And something that's particularly unique about Baba Duke is just people come out of it wanting to discuss its themes and really talk about it. I, I watched this again yesterday with my, my girlfriend and she yeah. rarely like is like, hey, let's talk about the themes. But immediately she started wanting to break things down and give our reads on yeah. stuff. And like Amazing. It, there's, there's something really special about this film that just resonates with people and they really want to engage with it. Has she seen it before? Or? No, it was her first time. Yeah, that's my hope for this is that people who haven't seen it, because it only released on a couple of screens in America at any one time when it when it was first released. So my hope is that people who've never seen it come out to check it out in the cinema. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I I wrote it with us. I was hoping to speak to something deeper about the human condition and about loss. Um, I just lost my dad pretty pretty shortly before I started writing, so I was in that space of, you know, contemplating what it's like to lose someone and what it would be like to lose someone so dear to you and not be able to grieve that. And that's how the sort of gen that was how the, the genesis of the film came about. The story is that what if this woman could not feel anything that she, she had to feel because it was just too scary and too painful. And so she just suppressed it all until it's kind of split off from her and became something else altogether. Um, yeah, yeah, those are such relatable themes. And uh, the film's legacy at this point is kind of interesting because there's just as many memes as there are like super deep readings and criticism and like uh, just looking into a deep dives. Yeah. Why do you think people are able to engage with this both very scholarly, but also have such fun with it? You, normally, it's one or the other. You don't see people yeah. going that hard uh, on both sides with the uh, Babadook. Yeah, I mean, you know, to know that it's being taught at, uni at some universities here and it's kind of crazy, but then, you know, people obviously hate it, which is all part of it as well. It's like, uh, ah, they, I can't stand that film. I mean, that's very much the horror crowd to kind of diss a lot of, a lot of uh, the films of the horror canon. So you kind of roll with that. But I, I think it's just amazing that it's still being talked about. You know, and that it has become a meme and it has become so recognisable. Uh, because when I made it, I mean, initially the people around me said, not not the people making the film, but, you know, financiers and other people said, you can't call a film The Babadook. No one's ever going to remember that. <laughs> you know? So I feel sort of quietly vindicated of that criticism because it's not true. People have remembered the name for sure. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned earlier when it was uh, originally released, it was very sparingly in U.S. theaters, and uh, yeah. this is a lot of people. They're going to be seeing it in the theaters for the very first time, which is really exciting, and uh, there's just a magic to seeing some of your favorite films on the big screen. So just how does that feel knowing that people are just very excited to go see this uh, in the way it was, you know, intentioned? It seems to be that there's this resurgence of people going back to the cinema. I think it's something that we crave as humans. Like I have a cinematheque in the city that I live here in Australia and they, they show free films uh, as much as possible. The films are, are free. There's no charge. And I, in the last month I've seen so many fantastic films, you know, I saw Robert Bresson retrospective of his films. You know, they're almost 60, 70 years old now, but they're incredible. And to see, I also saw 
2001, A Space Odyssey, last Friday night, and the cinema was packed. And to feel and be a part of a collective response to a film, there's nothing like it. It actually, I, I can't do without it. You know, it's something I really seek out. So I hope with this that there is a, yeah, my hope is that people come back and, and that there are big audiences and they're experiencing it collectively because it's a different, different experience. Yeah, it's definitely special. And what's also special in this film was Essie Davis's performance. What a yeah. what a wonder. Um, just uh, when you were working with her and seeing the just the grief that she's able to portray and in, in the breaking yeah. of this character. Uh, what, how, how was that working with her and really building this? Because it, 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 it's a just a wonderful performance. Yeah, I mean, she's such an underrated actress, I find. And I, w I was an actress. I went to uh, drama school, acting school with S. She was in the year below me. And so I knew her she, and she was a dear friend. And there's nothing like working with a friend, like working with your best buddy, you know, to make a film. It was really special. And I think she trusted me in a way that it can take a while to trust a, for an actor to trust a director, and we just slipped into that sort of instantly. So I was able to push her, you know, into those places, which she was very willing to go to uh, without, and she didn't feel, she felt safe and protected. Um, and so, yeah, and uh, you had the Nightingale come out after Babadook. I was curious, what, what were the biggest lessons that you really learned from the Babadook that you've really been able to employ in your work since then? I think I was more sort of self-assured. Uh, the 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 Nightingale, which I'm enormously proud of, was a very difficult film to make. I mean, you know, it was also a low budget. Not, I mean, Bubba was one point six. Nightingale was, you know, a lot more than that. But it was still, I think, under ten, around ten million. Which is, I mean, we had seventeen wild wilderness locations. You know, we had we we had to shoot in in autumn winter where there's not very much you know not very many daylight hours, um, and we were up mountains and you know we didn't fake any of that. So I learned to probably keep my cool a bit more and to trust. Once you've made a film, you know you can make a film. <laughs> With Babadook, I didn't know if I could make a film. I you know I was just sort of going on a wing and a prayer, but. Um, yeah, I think I think it was more of a confidence. Yeah, that's wonderful. My last question, you know, uh, fans have been eager to know what's next. Do you know what your next project is? Are you working on something? Yeah. Yes, I do. I can't say what it is because we're not allowed to release it. It's probably going to be released in about two weeks. But what I can say is that it's a famous horror writer, an adaptation of one of his books, and it's not Stephen King. <laughs> That's so exciting. I'm so excited for that. Thank you so much for your time, Jennifer. And and congrats on uh, getting your flowers on the 10th anniversary. It's such a special uh, film to so many people. So congratulations. Uh, thanks so much, Tyler.